story of the prodigal son completely fleshed out. What did y'all think? It was all right. <laughs> so, another thing we figured out in there is that, like, you were both right. Because at the beginning, when we talked about it, um, you know, I, when the question was posed, you know, which son is the one who's lost? You know, what what did you think? And, and you know, Billy said it was the, the older son uh, which was lost. You said it was the the younger son mm -hmm. and what's interesting is that you're both right and um, that they, they were both lost in that sense um, and you know the first question he asked here was was there anything from the DVD that was new to you or had an effect on you did you hear anything that raised questions in your mind Well, the one question I had is he was with the tax collectors and the Pharisees. The Pharisees are like the Christians of that time. Yeah, they were the religious, the morally upright, I guess you would say. And they collect, the tax collectors are the, just the low down, dirty Yeah, people. the tax collectors were considered low down, dirty, you know, thieves, you know, <clears throat> because they, they, tax collectors were known for, for bilking people. They were known for overcharging, you know, running up prices and gouging people because they made their living by doing that so they would they would gouge and and manipulate money from people you know they legalized thievery so um, when you have that dynamic of the two people that's the setup that's why it asked us to read you know verses one through three so you can see the setup and the audience of who he's speaking to he's speaking to an audience of both and you notice that the pharisees go oh great you know basically Oh man, look, the sinners are here. This is the kind of people this guy hangs out with, you know. He's supposed to be some teacher, you know, you know, the religious teacher here, Jesus, hangs out with these cats. You know, what's up with that? And then he tells them this story. And um, I think the one thing for me, when I first heard this, the one thing for me that stuck out about this story was how it does put it on its head. I mean, everybody, like he said, everybody kind of has that nostalgic um view of that story where it's a story about a younger son who runs off, does his thing, and then he comes back and the father shows mercy on him. The father represents God and that's how God is with us. God loves us so much that he comes to us from afar off and he and he loves on us and he brings us back into the fold. The end. But here you see that this older brother in the story is just as lost because as he said, the older brother does it through moral uprightness, you know, and I think for for us as Christians, I, I think we will, at some point, we will, we will kind of travel or have the potential to go in between those two characters, maybe even be somewhere in the middle. Um, what I like to call the older brother syndrome of Christians is what I like to call spiritual amnesia. Uh, it's where you, you get saved, and you've been saved for a minute, and you've kind of forgotten, you know, your sins have been covered by the blood, praise Jesus, and you've kind of forgotten, like, all the stuff you used to do in the past and who you were outside of Christ. So now every time you look at a sinner, forgetting what you used to be like, you look at them and you're like, oh, my God, yeah. how in the world could you be like that? How could you be doing this, you know? You're out there sleeping around, doing this <clears> and that, and you are you become... While all you're you're right, it's wrong, and they shouldn't be doing it. But you don't you don't attack it from a from a point of telling someone the truth out of love. You begin to judge them and instead of loving them and trying to tell them the truth with love. You want to say, you know what, you're a sinner. You need it. And what usually happens in that judgment is we start telling it wrong. We get it backwards. We start going. What you need to do is get yourself right with God. Start going to church and clean yourself up because you're a mess. And you know that starts this whole like down spiral for them because they're really taking that to heart. The first thing you will realize, as he told us there, first thing you're gonna realize is you can't. You can't. You can't make yourself right. There's nothing you can do uh, to make yourself right. Uh, matter of fact. The scripture tells us that. Romans 3. Verse 
If you go to Romans 3, and Romans 3, Romans 3, 9 through 19. All right, Romans 3, Romans 3, 9 through 20, actually. Do you want to read that one or do you want me to read it, Johnny? I'll read it. Okay. 9 through 20. Uh, what then are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written... None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, and their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For the work, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Okay, so that verse is basically saying, thanks for reading that. That verse is basically saying that, you know, and it, and it has this list of things that we're all guilty of, you know, whether in thought or in deed, we're all guilty of these things. And and that, you know, by working the law, the law can only bring about knowledge of sin. Do you know what that means? No, I don't. Okay, that means that the law is only capable of showing basically what you can't do. Laws are put on us to keep us under control, one. If you were really righteous, you wouldn't need laws. Because you would do what was right without the fear of a consequence. Right? True. If you were truly righteous, you wouldn't need law because you would just do it. There, you would not have to know. There would not have to be a sign to remind you to drive 55. You wouldn't need red lights. You wouldn't need stop stop signs and all that stuff. You wouldn't need any of that. You wouldn't need something to tell you not to commit adultery. You wouldn't need that because you just wouldn't do it. You might be saying to yourself, <clears throat> "Well, I don't. I don't commit adultery. I drive 55. That's great. You do those, but there are other things you don't do. And when you, even when we do do them, as he point, as Tim Keller pointed out, even when you do do them." You do them because you want people to say what? That you're a good guy. That you're a good guy. That you're great. You're swell. You're awesome. Man, you do everything right, man. I love you to death. You're just an awesome cat. I never have to ask you twice. But in your mind, you're like, yeah, you don't have to ask me twice because I want that paper. When you do a good job at work, why do you do a good job at work? Be honest. To keep the job, I guess. Keep the job and to get paid. You don't want to get fired. You're not doing it. I mean, rarely do you ever get to a point where at some point, sometimes we do get to a point where we're like, you know what? I do my job because it's my calling. I want to do it. And that, then that still has to come through Christ and through God. It will not come on your own because wages are earned. You work to earn wages, right? But we didn't earn our salvation. And to try to earn your salvation it leaves you, yeah, it, it leaves you in dire straits because that means that you have, if you try to fulfill by doing good, that means you have to live by the law. That means you have to, you have to completely, accurately follow the law. You have to. And well, I think the point is that you, you can't do it through works. I think that was the, right. the, other, the other part, the other part of the story, story there, you know, besides, besides the, um, the younger son coming mm -hmm. back. And saying, saying, "Hey, I'm not, not I'm not worthy," and, and the uh, and the other uh, father accepted him. Yeah. Also, to the other thing was that, hey, you know, he yeah, he wanted to, he wanted to, he wanted to do work. He wanted to become, he wanted to become um, like a um, 
uh, what did he say? The working uh, man. Uh, uh, the, work, the working man. You right. know, he want, he he thought <clears throat> that he could he could uh, earn his way back back in with his father by doing by doing by doing work. Right. By, do, by doing doing works, uh, and father you know, and father told him, hey, not only do you I mean, basically, if you can't do that, you, you don't you don't need you don't need to do that. You know, same way on the other end, the old the older brother, you know, exactly. thought thought that he thought that by um because he had worked, thought, yeah, he had worked, and, and he thought by following the law and by following the this, this strict uh, list of rules that that uh, that that was the way to come to the father, you know, and mm-hmm. and, and neither neither way, you know, was is, is the is the way to come to the father. Right, and it's 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 all on the father. The father has to. Give it to you. either way, and what they told him. They're missing, both the same. They're both the same, and either way, the father had to give it to him. Either way, if the father doesn't give them, if he doesn't give the inheritance to the older son, he doesn't get it, right? Yep. And if he doesn't give the inheritance to the younger son, he doesn't get it. So it's still the initiation of the father, like he said. Reform theology one hundred one. Since we haven't mentioned it on tape yet, cast out of the bag. <laughs> Reform theology one on one. You know, this is the this is the crux of it. You know, God is the great initiator. In both situations, we see God initiated. God running to that younger son while he's afar off. You know, the father running to that son while he's afar off, just like God does to us. While we were yet still weak, Christ died for the ungodly. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's the scripture says. So we are, you know, we are nothing but beggars and recipients. Okay, that that's all we are. This verse is really strong as far as the righteousness. And the reason why we're probably going to stick on the righteousness is because, like like we, we saw here, is that it's easy to pinpoint the sinful guy. Yeah. The bad guy. That's the easy part. Where it starts to get difficult is when we start trying to get into it where people were like, man, I pay taxes. I am, like, a great citizen. I don't cheat on my wife. I love my kids. You know, and then you come telling me that I'm still, like, a sinner? I'm dirty? Yeah. And God says so through the prophet Isaiah, and he says so in really, really strong terms. And he says it in this way. Isaiah 64, 6 says, We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Now, the reason why I say it says it's in the strongest terms, this has been cleaned up in modern language. When it says polluted garment, you might have a note in your Bible on that, Johnny. I don't know. It, so, where, is it? where is it? It's Isaiah 50, 64 and 6. Does it have a note on what the polluted garment actually is in there? Yeah, it said, un- unclean, unfit to be in God's presence. Mm-hmm. But the and, the, pollute, and polluted, polluted garment, garment stained by menstruation. Okay. Did you hear that? So what does that mean? It's a rag. That's right. So what he's basically saying <clears throat> is, when you try to be good on your own terms. When you try to meet God with your own righteousness, you show up in front of him looking like a used up dirty rag with blood and think about how strong of an image that is. I mean, that's what, so when you think you're doing good and you think you're all right, you're a used up tampon. That's strong. Yeah. Okay, that's how serious it is when you try to go to God with your own self righteousness. You show up dirty and filthy, and there's, you don't get much filthier than that. I can think of very few things that would be filthier than a, than a used up menstrual rag. Right? Um, but anyway, uh, so that's how we are when we try to go to God with our own righteousness, and I, and I love how He shows the lostness of both. In the story, and even today, it's still shocking. Especially when you talk to, I mean, like he said, you got two ways. You got the way of self-discovery, and you have the way of, of, of 
of self righteousness or, or moral, you know, following a, a strict moral code. But being, the, but they're both after the same thing. Yeah, they're both after the same thing. They want the stuff, <clears throat> but not the father. But not the father. They want the gifts, but not the gift giver. And so that's why it, it's all idolatry in the end, because you you're ultimately you after the stuff. For instance, how does that look if we play out? Okay, you hear about people becoming Christians after they have a, you know, they've had a hard life, and, and they, you hear about them, they become Christians, right? They, they want, they want to come to Jesus. But in a lot of cases, you'll see that, and then like a few, a little time later, things will get good, and then you'll kind of see them fall off or whatever. Or maybe you'll see them fall off when things aren't going so good. They come to Christ, and things don't get any better. Maybe they even get a little worse, and then they they fall off, right? And so you start looking and you're like, wow, wow, why'd that happen? It could very well be, in some cases, not all, but in some, it could be that they fall off because of the fact that they were coming to God for the wrong reasons. For the wrong reasons, they were coming to God because they wanted to get their their needs met. You know, they were coming to God because, just like I heard a friend of ours the other day, who will remain nameless, but, you know, they're struggling, going through some stuff. It's like, I don't understand. I'm doing everything right. I'm doing everything good. I'm going to church. Why am I still struggling? Why? And I was like, Jesus loved Lazarus enough to let him die. That was the only thing I could think of because that was from my Bible study and I didn't really have a whole lot of time when I was talking to them to go into detail. But that was the, the one thing that, that I said. Or, or, you know, other friends of ours, I've heard, like, man, I'm having troubles when I'm married. So I started going to church. <laughs> well, okay. But starting to go to church because you're having troubles when you're married, are you, going, are you really, go, are you starting to go to church because you are now in the family of God and you want to worship and you're about authentic worship, or are you going to church because you need a you need a specific need met at this period in your life? You your marriage is falling apart, and you're trying to hold it together. So maybe I'll try some Jesus because I need my marriage to stay together, or maybe I'll maybe I'll try some Jesus because I want my pain to stop, or maybe I'll try some Jesus because I want my I want. You know, I need better money and I need a better job. So if I go to Jesus, he'll give me that. So ultimately, you reduce the the king of the universe, the king of the world, and the God who made the creation. You reduce him to a cosmic bellhop. Ding! Bring me my new Bentley. Ding! Bring me my new rays. Ding! Bring me my husband. Ding! Bring And so now this is what you're doing. If you rub the lamp the right way, Jesus gets you what you want. And that's idolatry. Right? Yeah. So we have to change our way of thinking. Our prize is Jesus. If you prize Jesus, and Jesus says this in the Sermon on the Mount, this was one of the first things that we started studying when we were doing the Balcony Boys Bible study. And um, um, it's in Matthew 5. And, and Jesus actually talked about this. He says... My bad. Matthew 5 and there's a couple things from the Sermon on the Mount that, that really can be stressed here for this particular study the first thing is when I, I'm going to but the first thing is like when we talk about fulfilling the law, we're trying to do the right thing to get to God. Um, Jesus says here, 517, he says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one iota, not one dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. 
For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees of heaven. Now you might read that and you might go, but wait a minute. Isn't that like proving the point in reverse? Because here you're saying, he's saying you got you to have the, the same kind of righteousness. It needs to actually be better than that of the Pharisees, right? That's what it says, unless it exceeds that of the Pharisees, right? Yes. Okay. It says you need to exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. So how do we do that? He says that it will be fulfilled. That's the key. How do we, how does our righteousness succeed? I'm going to make the statement. I'm going to go out and say it does exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. How? Remember, he said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. And not heaven and earth, none of this will pass away until all is fulfilled. I'm gonna, like I said, I'm going out on a limb. I'm going to say that it has been fulfilled. And I'm going to say that it, our righteousness does exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. And how does that happen? Jesus. Exactly. Go on. How? Because <clears throat> he died for our sins. Mm -hmm. And then not only did he die for our sins, but we, we overlooked the, the first half of what he did. He didn't just die for our sins. We know we talked about it, and in, in Johnny brought it up. In the in, uh, in when we did talk about the resurrection, is that he didn't have to stay dead because he wasn't guilty. He was he lived a perfect life. He followed the law that, to that the curse. Well, how'd you say that? He curses what? everyone who hangs from a tree because when you break the law, the, the wage of sin the wages of sin is death. You know, everyone stands guilty on the law. Jesus did not. He fulfilled the law perfectly for us. So therefore, yes, the law has been fulfilled in Christ. We, when we put our faith in what he did and not our own self-righteousness, which is a menstrual rag, we, our righteousness now does exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees, and that is how we are saved. So, yes, we should not depend on our self-righteousness. Okay? So that's, that's how we deal with dealing with the righteous part. Okay? The, dealing with that issue. The next is when we look at when we look at the idea of of what we should be getting after so even though we know that it's been fulfilled in Christ we still don't go to Christ just to have our needs met we go to Christ in order to for Christ himself for the kingdom of God itself we don't go for the sake of just going and saying like you know that that oh well I'm gonna go to Jesus because I need this stuff I need to have my marriage right I need this so I need to go to Jesus for that Matthew still in the Sermon on the Mount but it's Matthew 6 and and this is Matthew 6 John if you want to read this one you can read Matthew 6 25 and all the way down through 33. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body. What you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith, therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father seeks that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. 
Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Okay, so we see there, if we come to Jesus, for Jesus, and for the glory and for the kingdom of God, what is the promise given there? No worries. Exactly. And every, it says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, which is in Christ. Right? And all these things will be added to you. So God will provide your needs as they come up. You don't have to worry about, you know, I'll give you an example. We can use today's example. I'm running right here. Car don't check. Right? Lockdown. Okay? Now, in any other situation, this would be a state of panic. Right? If I have nothing but, if I know that God will provide my needs. As I walk around here today, technically, as he has pointed out so many times today, I'm broke. In a very technical sense. But that need will be met through the charity of friends, through God's provision in other ways that might be, you know, whatever might happen. You know, we overlook those things all the time. When, like, you need something, all of a sudden someone goes, hey, you need a ride, you need this, you need that. Da, 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 da. Right, you know, and it, there's so many times when that stuff happens and we overlook it. You know, I still have my car to drive. I can go somewhere. I can leave. I can do this. I can do that. So I'm not completely in lockdown. Now the panic will happen is if I forget that and I start going, what am I going to do? I don't have any money. I got to go out and do something. I got to go take out a loan. I got to go do this. I got to do this. I got to go take out a loan because right now my car is unlocked and I got to do something. I got to do some tad. I got to go pawn something real quick. And I start panicking about this and I start making a lot of decisions based on what because and what's happening in that moment? What am I, what am I not doing in that moment? Not having faith. Yeah, I have no trust in God to provide for my needs at all. You don't. You're not dependent on God. I mean, uh, you you need. You have to be have complete dependence on on, on God. Right, and it's like Very the it's like the elder son. So in some ways, and also in the contrast in the, in the two in the two stories, the elder son is worried about his estate. Right, he's like, man, where? Wait a minute. If we take this dude back, then that means that I'm gonna have to split my inheritance. I'm about to cut in half. I'm not going to get two-thirds. I'm going to get half. Or even like a quarter, really. Because that half now has to be split. Again. Again. So the idea here is like, you know, he's like worried about that. And in some ways you can see where when you're brought low, like the, like the, like the initial son, the first son, you can see how low you are. Yeah? And I thought it was interesting in the dynamic, not in your personalities, but I thought it was interesting how one answered one and the other answered the other. The new Christian said the older, because that's probably how you viewed a lot of Christians. Would that be a correct? I, I, I would say that's pretty, pretty old. Okay, and then you said it from being a Christian for a minute, you said the young son, because that's what we've always been taught about, because I answered the same way the first time I heard it. I was like, it's, it's the younger son, because the younger son, you know, that, that's, that's, that's the guy. He's the center guy. That's, you know, Jesus is showing the compassion of God on sinners. Great story. Love it. But it's both. And I love that fact that it's both, because it reminds us who have been Christians longer to beware of becoming complacent in your place in Christ and forgetting the depths of which you were brought back from. And for you, it's that constant reminder on from where you're coming from, still having those moments where you might fall off a little bit, where sin might try to be tugging at your elbow, reminding you that you are in the grace of Christ and the Father has come from far off and sent the elder brother in Christ to bring you home. So you have no need to worry. Your status is secure. You're safe. You don't have to work your way back in. Even when you mess up, you can come freely to the Father and say, help me. I'm in trouble. Okay? So I love this story because it doesn't leave anybody out. It doesn't let anybody settle in and say, man, you're okay. You're good. You're, you're awesome. Where you are. It's always a reminder. Even on this side of things, we still need the grace of God and that surety, and we still need to hear the gospel every day, just as much as a younger Christian like yourself still needs to hear the gospel every day, because it's easy to forget on either side where you, you know, what really brought you here. That also proves that there's never, 
There's always room for growth. There's always room for growth. And and like I love how he changed the title. He said that the parable has been mis mis uh misappropriated and it hasn't been properly named. Because who's the real prodigal in this story? God. Or the father. The father. The father's the one who's given up everything. Mm -hmm. And so the idea here is this is it's the, the story is a constant reminder of it like he said it's the divine initiative god seeks out sinners he seeks out elder brothers and younger brothers and he brings them home and we're never ever ever to forget that because the second we forget that that's when we start going on the path of self-discovery going you know what i'm gonna do my own thing i'm gonna get this my own way and then that's when we go the other way into the path of or moral correctness and say you know what i'm good because I don't really got nothing wrong with me. I pay taxes. I'm a good cat. You know, gee, why wouldn't Jesus want to accept me? You know, because either one can send you into a tailspin. One can be like, I know I'm accepted and there's a false sense of security. And the other could be, man, I'm so dirty and sinful. God don't love me anyway. So I'm just going to peel all the way off and live my own life. I'm, I'm so far outside of this, man. I'm so, and I've heard people say that, and that's one of the worst conversations I have with someone when they're like, man, I'm so far gone from this, there is no reason for me to even try to come back. Well, that's what, I think that's where I was at one point. Mm -hmm. well, what's, what's, what's the point of coming back? Right. But now you know. You don't have to I'm, go. I'm, I was brought back anyway. Right. You don't have to come because he's going to come and get you. Yep. He came and get you. And that's the, for all you out there. Predestination, it's it's real and it's in, it's in it's in scripture. So, um, you know, I mean, that's that's the thing. And in, in, in putting this into perspective, it helps you appropriate a lot of other things in scripture to you know about salvation. And it helps you see salvation. I love this parable because especially when Keller breaks it down, you see it explained. It helps you understand how salvation really works. And uh, and so I'm I'm just I, you know I'm cuckoo for cocoa puffs over this. So. Anybody? Anything else with that? Who? Uh, so, like, we, we all said who we identify with. You know, I obviously identify more with the older brother in this case. You know, I, th I, I think, but, but you have to be careful with even saying that because sometimes we can go back and forth. There yeah, might be days where so. you feel like the younger brother. Might be days where I feel like the older brother. You know. Um, um, so, I mean, that's pretty much it, you know, just, uh, we can, we can continue this in the smaller segments for the rest of the group we want to. It actually breaks the parable down into the different sections, or, you know, we'll move on depending upon how we feel, but that is, that is a, I, I think it was a great session. I, I like that, I like that DVD and I like that video, so, um, you know, you guys. Eventually it all comes down to zeros and ones whether it's the sum of your bank account or the last day to come. Credited with a federal deficit from an act of Confederate arrogance. Lord grant leniency for our inconvenience because the ledger won't ever find a balance. No power to the people dying on empty bellies and wallets, but the number one killer of the nations is that they perish for a lack of knowledge. Deprived and depraved because I don't give a damn about the rising poverty level and the notion of goodness is a sham. The more zeros I need in my bank to put one gallon in my tank, my daily bread goes missing and so does my thanks. They say the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and these churches love stacking dough to keep raising up steeples. Bake it, but don't break it. Press down and shake it, but never stirring the collective conscience of the people to feed the needy and to serve them. Salvation's army shouldn't ever come to harm me. Whatever happened to the Great Commission are showing faith, hope, and charity. Hilarious giving is no laughing matter. When you serve the suffering servant, it's not an option. Follow after him. To be born as an orphan doesn't turn you into a bastard. To get the message crossed up leads to evangelical disaster. The first will be last and the last will be first. The first death leaves you breathing, but the second lays down the worst. So stop peddling headstones and returning people to slavery. Strive to share the truth and love with the utmost transparency. Christ bears the scars as a reminder of the cost so that we can openly display our weakness to show the glory of the cross. A not to do list is always sealed with a hiss and reeks of self-righteous piety that deserves to be dismissed. 
Spiritual amnesia leads to legalistic procedures that spit in the face of grace and gets it backwards for unbelievers. Because you cannot have gay sex and still be a wreck. You cannot put lips to liquor and still be a mess. Behavior modifications don't necessarily mean you have the savior. It just makes your public appearance acceptable, but leaves your private life unsavory. No, the task of salvation isn't to make you a better person or for you to appear perfect and blameless to a world that's starving and hurting. We're just a finger pointing at the moon which gives us light by reflecting the sun. So in the end, it just goes back to the beginning. It all comes down to zeros and ones.